Kapitali. Pois o Lord Kapitali. I am just so glad to join us this afternoon. Give an honor to my Bishop Pastor Rosa Johnson, to Pastor Walker, to Elder Stallings, to the ministers, the elders, to all the first ladies, and to you, you, and especially you. I thank you for coming out and sharing in this annual Women's Council service, uh, working together in unity. And how many of you know that there is power in working together? There is power in working together. And I am so happy to see all of us that I've had sat in the churches and helped work with you, and now you came to be a blessing to help work with me. In Jesus' name. At this time, we are going to have the welcome address by Mother Thelma Lewis. Acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
I ask for a blessing over this entire congregation of your children, and I ask these things in the master's name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Church, our scripture lesson for my, my portion is actually the scripture lesson for this program today. It is Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, and it reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit of the body of peace. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. These words were spoken by Abraham Lincoln in 1858. His, his opponent had proposed that the question of slavery be left to each individual state. But Lincoln knew that the United States would inevitably become all slave bearing or all free. The division permeated every political question of the day, and until it was resolved, Lincoln knew that the Union could not and would not stand. Similarly, we know that even in our own homes, a house divided will not stand. Proverbs 25, 24 says, it is better to live on a corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Today, today, we often see on the bumper stickers, on the back of many cars, a truism, happy wife, happy life. In Matthew 12, 25, and in Mark 3, 25, and then again in Luke 11, 17, Jesus states this fundamental principle, that if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. So the theme for this evening's program is working together in unity. And the scripture is taken from the book of Ephesians, which is actually a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus. The letter was not written to address any particular concern, but rather it was a passionate letter to encourage the church and to promote unity within the church. Today's churches, we know, are, compr are comprised of people from various backgrounds, different social and economic statuses, different races. We have different ideologies, we have different tastes, we have different temperaments, and we have different tolerances. Some are further along in their Christian walk than others. Some were raised Cogent, some were raised Baptist, some CME, AME, Catholic, etc. But the good news is that none of these differences mean a hill of beans to God. The only thing that matters is for our faith in the one true and living God. Romans 10, 12 tells us, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Yes. See, as believers, we are part of God's family. We are no longer strangers and foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, united through the blood of Jesus Christ. See, before Christ, we were under God's curse. But now as believers, we are loved by God. Before Christ, we were doomed because of our sin. But now we are shown mercy and given salvation. Before Christ, we were ashamed of our sin. But now there is no shame in it, for our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Before we went along with the crowd, but now we stand firmly united in Christ. Before we were enslaved to Satan, but now we are free in Christ. Before we were afraid to die, but now, O oh death, where is thy sin? O oh great, where is thy victory? See, in comparison to the gift of God that we receive through Jesus Christ, the petty differences between us, between us, they don't matter. What an awesome privilege and honor it is to be a part of God's family, to be a recipient of his grace. Paul explains all of these blessings in the first three chapters of Ephesians. But after explaining all the riches that we have in Christ Jesus, Paul begins in chapter 4 to tell us what our responsibility as Christians is. See, he says our first responsibility as a Christian is our duty to walk in unity. In chapter 4, verse 1, the apostle Paul beseeches us. That means he, he's begging us. He's imploring us that we ought to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. In other words, Paul is saying, knowing that all Christ has done for you, 
You want to act like you got some sense. You want to act like you are a Christian. Act as if you understand the price that was paid for your salvation. Act as if you truly appreciate the gift that you've received through Christ. This means that when you come into this house, you don't sit down as if you're here to be entertained. When you come into church knowing all that Christ has done for you, you want to come to worship him. Know that you come to give him the highest praise because he is God. Don't come to church for form and fashion. Come to give God the glory. We ought to be rushing to church to get through the doors so that we can come together with other saints and give praise unto God. This is what God desires. He desires our praise. If you are coming to church for any other reason than to praise God, then you're wasting your time. As a Christian, we ought to recognize that every breath we take is a gift from God. Therefore, every exhale should be a praise and a worship to Him. It doesn't matter if you are the sexton. It doesn't matter if you are the usher. It doesn't matter if you sing in the choir or if you sit in the pulpit. Our duty is to come together and to glorify his name. That is our only duty. And everything that we do should glorify God. Because in the end, it is only what we do for Christ that's going to last. So now that we know why we're here, how do we stay united in this soul? And we thank God for the instruction manual that he's left us. Because the first step towards unity is humility. See, the Bible tells us that we can stay united, we ought to walk in all lowliness and in all meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one and, and, and one another in love. As a Christian, just as Christ was lowly and meek, we too need to be lowly and meek. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, does not Jesus say, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me." For I am meek and lowly in heart. As followers of Christ, we've got to be humble. We've got to be gentle. We've got to be patient, understanding, and peaceful. This means that there's no place for discord in the church of God. We ought not to instigate separate factions within the church, separate subgroups of like-mindedness when one or more don't agree with the decision made by church leadership. We ought not run from one person to the next sowing seeds of discontent. There is no place for backbiting. There's no place for gossip. No place for criticism and animosity, jealousy, anger, or bitterness in the church of God. There is nothing worse, church, than a disgruntled member besieging some new soul to Christ and loading them down with all the garbage that they come with. Nothing dampens the spirit of a new Christian more than hearing so-called Christians tear one another down. There's no place either for the proud in church. Every decision of the church need not be met with your stamp of approval. It is not, if it's not cut from, the cross, the, from your cross, then you don't want to have anything to do with it. Church, we've got to stop treating God with the back of our hand. We've got to stop turning our back on God's promises when things don't go our way. He's been too good to us for us to turn our backs on him. The negative attitudes that we see, the barriers, they all present barriers to the unity that's required, and they're not the fruit of the Spirit. See, we have no right to act pompous and full of pride in God's house. For what world did we create? What moon did we hang in the sky? But well, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Proverbs 16, 18 tells you that pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Some of us sit in church and we say, I can't stand the pastor, or I can't stand the deacon, or I can't stand sister so-and-so. I heard Jesus say in Matthew 75, you hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to feel the respect of your own eye. As Christians, we ought not to provoke at others or be offended by their infirmities, but rather as Christians, we should bear their infirmities in love. Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, 
lest thou be tempted. Each of us ought to recognize that there but for the grace of God go out. See, humility will not allow us to harbor resentment, but rather it will allow us to forgive. Without humility, there is no meekness, there's no patience, and there's no forbearance. And without these things, there is no unity. So let us be humble one to another. We who are strong, we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not pleasing ourselves. See, these things I speak of, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, these come only with the unctioning of the Holy Spirit. Each is a fruit of the Spirit. And on our own, we are simply not capable of achieving the humility and the meekness that's required. See, it is only through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that we can maintain these bonds of peace. Because we are his children, God has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, and the Holy Spirit is what binds us together. See, even though I'm a member of St. James Missionary Baptist Church in New Britain, Connecticut, I can come to the Refuge Church of God and Christ in Waterbury, Connecticut, and I can feel right at home. See, by virtue of having the Spirit, as believers, we are in union with every other believer, and this is the unity that we must work to keep. We must allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. We must submit to it, and we must not resist it. We must endeavor to maintain it in our homes, on our jobs, and in our churches. Church, I am so glad this morning, this evening, that Jesus Christ is not like some of us. I am so glad that he can look beyond my faults and see my needs. I am so glad that he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell within me. I am so glad that Jesus thought enough of me to put on a body and come through 40 and two generations to save a sin-sick world like you and, like to save a sin-sick world for you and for me. I am thankful that he laid down his life for me. But more than anything, church, I'm glad that he got up on that third day. And now he is seated on the right hand of God, making intercession for you and for me. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement Give you the spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5 and 6. Amen. Coming together, working together in Jesus' name.